Would you please open your Bibles with me to 1 Peter chapter 1? A month ago, we examined a phrase which Peter uses to address the Christians to whom he is writing. Peter calls them elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father. And so we studied the doctrine of election along with the doctrine of preterition, that God has chosen a people and he has passed over the rest. These Christians to whom Peter is writing are Christians because God chose them. Peter writes to them and says, God chose you. Now, I want to, in this sermon, focus on a question of chosen for what? God chose you, but for what or unto what did God choose you? And so let's read 1 Peter 1, 1 and 2, and then we will have a three-point outline. 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who are elect exiles of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, in the sanctification of the Spirit, for obedience to Jesus Christ, and for sprinkling with his blood. May grace and peace be multiplied to you. Now, Peter tells us in these verses that the, these Christians were chosen or elected for three things. And that's going to be our three-point outline, but we're going to change the order a little bit. So here's our first point. Number one, we need to note, number one, that God has set us apart. God has set us apart. Chosen for what? Chosen first to be set apart apart as a special, a peculiar, a holy people unto God. The Apostle Peter says that God chose them to be set apart by the Holy Spirit. They were chosen for consecration or sanctification as we have it translated in the ESV. Elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father in the sanctification of the Spirit. That's where I'm getting the consecration, the set apart as holy by God. God has set us apart to be a special people unto himself. Now, how does God do this? How does God set apart a people to be special unto himself? If we survey the history of God dealing with mankind as recorded in the scriptures, we find that God consecrates people or sets them apart through covenants. God makes a covenant with a people, and that covenant determines the details of in what way or to what extent God has set them apart or consecrated or sanctified them. So let me give you some examples to illustrate what I mean when I say that God sets people apart by covenant. Think about Adam. God created Adam, and then God placed him in Eden, and then God gave him commands about the trees. Of all the trees of the garden you may eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you may not eat, for on the day you eat thereof you shall surely die. So God, in a special way, placed Adam in a special place and gave him special commands about the trees and promised him life if he obeyed God's commands. God made a covenant with Adam. We call that the covenant of works. And the point to, to note is simply that God made a special arrangement. God set Adam in a special situation by making a covenant with him. That covenant defines what's special about Adam and what he must do, what the penalties are for disobedience, what the promises are for faithfulness. That's just one example. What's another example of God using, making a covenant with someone and thereby making them a special people? Think about Abraham. Abraham is just one other man among the many men of mankind in his day. But God calls Abraham... And God makes a covenant with Abraham. And what did God covenant to Abraham? He gave him a land. Abraham, to you and to your offspring after you, I give to you the land of Canaan with boundaries from here to here. These are the boundaries of the inheritance of land I'm giving to you. 
and you and your offspring after you who are circumcised, you will live in this land as my special and holy people. Did Abraham have a right to that land? Did his descendants have a right to that land prior to that covenant? No, it was by making that covenant with Abraham that God set Abraham apart and all his descendants and consecrated them to be a special and holy people in a special and holy land. One more example. Think of King David. What does the book of Judges say at least three times? That there was no king in Israel. You just had tribes and tribal leaders and tribal heads clan leaders and such, and then you had Moses and Joshua over them all, but there was no king in Israel. And so God raised up judges in this particular place for this particular time, but there was no consistent leadership or rule in Israel until God established the line of David, skipping over Saul for, for reasons we could go into, but God did not make a covenant with Saul. God made a covenant with David. And when God made a covenant with David, he set apart David and his line, you and your offspring, you will be the kings of my people, Israel and Judah. And so God, by covenant, set apart Adam and his offspring in a special way. God, by covenant, set apart Abraham and his descendants in a special way. God, by covenant, set apart David and his descendants in a special way. But what I want us to understand is that when Peter says that God chose us, God chose Christians unto the sanctification of the Spirit to be set apart by the Spirit, the way in which God has set us apart is also by covenant. God has made a covenant with us, and this covenant sets us apart from the rest of the world. We are consecrated by covenant. What covenant is that? It's the new covenant. By virtue of the new covenant, God has set apart a special people to be holy unto himself. Well, I want you to read with me two passages that tell us about the new covenant. Turn to Ezekiel chapter 36, please. When you buy a house, people say, this is California, what are you talking about? When you buy a house, you want to know the details the details are all important to you, aren't they? What is the contract that we are dealing with here? If you make a business deal, the details are all important to you. What am I selling at what cost? What am I receiving at what cost, etc.? If you buy a car, the details are all important to you. How much will this cost per month? Interest rates, this and that. We, we stress about the details. Well, if I tell you, you are in covenant with God, do you want to know the details? Is it, are they important to you? Are the details of God's covenant with you important to you? I've said that God has consecrated us by covenant. God has set us apart from the world by covenant. We might say, well, what are the blessings? What are the benefits? What are the commands? Ezekiel chapter 36, verses 24 to 27. God promises, I will take you from the nations and gather you from all the countries and bring you into your own land. I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you shall be clean from all your uncleanness, and from all your idols I will cleanse you. And I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you. And cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules. These are details of God's covenant with us. He sets us apart as holy and he says, I'm going to wash you. I'm going to purify you. I'm going to make you holy unto myself. And I'm going to put my spirit within you. And so you will be my special and holy people. So when Peter says that we have been chosen for sanctification by the Spirit, what he's talking about is one of the new covenant promises. God has set us apart by covenant and made us a holy people unto himself and put his Spirit within us. You are my special people. Notice verse 24. God gathers a people from all the nations 
and he brings them together. He collects them, and he makes them holy unto himself. Well, Peter writes to Greco-Roman random people from our perspective, from five different provinces, and he says, you all from different places have been collected into the church because God has consecrated you. God has sanctified you, made you holy, and set you apart unto himself. The, the prophet Ezekiel says, you will be cleansed, sprinkled with pure water. This will wash away your uncleanness. Well, Peter tells these Christians that they are sanctified by the Spirit and that they are also washed, but washed with blood. And we'll come back to that in a later point. Now turn with me to Jeremiah 31. This is the more well-known passage describing the new covenant, which is quoted in full in Hebrews chapter 8 and in part in Hebrews chapter 10 and elsewhere in the scriptures. The largest quote from the Old Testament is this portion as it's reproduced in Hebrews chapter 8. Jeremiah 31, verses 33 and 34. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them, and I will write it on their hearts. And I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And no longer shall each one teach his neighbor and each his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me from the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity, and I will remember their sin no more. This is the same as Ezekiel chapter 36, isn't it? God will set apart a special people for himself. He will cleanse them and he will cause them to be obedient unto his law. They will live for me and I will forgive their sins. So we conclude in the first place that God has set us apart by the new covenant. God chose us in Christ and he has called us by his spirit and given us his spirit all of these are new covenant promises. We are set apart as God's covenant people. Secondly, in the second place, Peter tells us that we have been chosen. Secondly, God has set us apart from sin. God has set us apart from sin. Peter says that when we are sanctified by the Spirit, when we are consecrated unto God and set apart for Him, it leads to two things. One of those two things is that we are sprinkled with the blood of Jesus Christ. We are sprinkled with the blood of Jesus Christ. A moment ago, we read in Ezekiel that God will sprinkle us with clean water that will clean us from all our uncleanness and cleanse us. You hear the repetitive nature of clean, clean, unclean, cleanse. God's making a point. I will wash you completely with pure water. Well, in the fullness of the scriptures, what is that pure water? What is it that washes us and makes us clean from all our uncleanness? It is the blood of Jesus Christ. And that's what Peter mentions here. We are sprinkled with the blood of Jesus Christ, set apart by God to be those who receive the sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ, which cleanses us and forgives us of all our sins, which, of course, was the new covenant promise. I will remember their sins no more. In the, in the book of Exodus, when Israel comes to Mount Sinai and is given the law of God, Moses declares the covenant to the people, and then he sprinkles blood upon them and says, this is the blood of the covenant. He's telling the Israelites, God has purified you and, and set you apart to live unto him according to this covenant that he has made with you this day. So God sets his people apart by covenant and he sanctifies them. He sprinkles them with the blood. But what kind of blood was that that Moses sprinkled the people with? It was animal blood. It purified them outwardly. It purified the flesh. But the writer to the Hebrews tells us, that the blood of Jesus Christ, it does more than that, doesn't it? The blood of Jesus Christ does not purify the flesh. What does the blood of Christ purify? The blood of Jesus Christ with which we are sprinkled purifies the conscience 
the writer to the Hebrews says, it removes our sin once and for all by one single and perfect and everlasting sacrifice. How does God make us holy unto himself? He sets us apart by putting his spirit in us and he sprinkles us with the blood of Jesus Christ, removing our sins, forgiving us of our sins, setting us apart from sin. He says, here's your sin, here's your wickedness, here's your guilt, here's the condemnation that you deserve because of it. I am separating you from that by sprinkling you with the blood of Jesus Christ. Is the blood of Christ enough? What does the book of Hebrews say? Is the blood of Christ enough? If it's enough, then once and for all we are cleansed forever. And it is enough. Jesus' blood purifies us and sets us apart from our sin. God chose us, and he called us, and he consecrated us, and he separated us from our sin. In Christ's blood, we are cleansed. Now, it's a wonderful thing to be reminded of that, isn't it? If only we had some kind of visible reminder of the blood of Jesus Christ in which our sins are forgiven. Jesus gave us precisely that. He gave us the Lord's Supper. And he said, eat this bread and drink this cup. This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for many for the remission of sins. And so what Peter brings up here to remind these Christians in a letter is something that Jesus gave to them to be enjoyed and reminded of on a regular basis. The blood of Jesus Christ is what cleanses us from our sins. The Apostle Peter reminds them of this, of this wonderful and precious truth. He says to them, you have been set apart by the Spirit as a holy people. You have been sprinkled with the blood of Jesus Christ and cleansed from all your iniquities. What's the third thing that he tells them? Number three, God has set us apart for obedience. God has set us apart for obedience. We are elect, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, in the sanctification of the Spirit, set apart as holy unto God for obedience to Jesus Christ. I reversed the order because the next one is sprinkling in his blood. But now we come to this for obedience to Jesus Christ. If we have been set apart by God to be a holy people unto him, he determines the way in which we live. He determines the way in which we live as his holy people. Here again, this is precisely what Ezekiel and Jeremiah said. These are the terms of the covenant, aren't they? In Ezekiel and Jeremiah, God says, I will put my law in their hearts. I will cause them to walk in my ways and keep my commandments. I will make them careful to obey my rules. Obedience unto our Lord and Savior, a life lived according to his law, this is the way of the covenant. God writes his law on our hearts and we live by it. In fact, he set us apart for this. He predestined us to walk in good works which he prepared for us. These two things, sprinkled with the blood of Christ and obedient unto Jesus Christ, really form, the re they really guide the rest of the letter. The rest of 1 Peter will be about these two things. Who are we? We are the people cleansed by the blood of Jesus Christ. And how should we live in light of that? So obedience unto Jesus Christ and sprinkling with, with his blood in many ways sum up the book, just like exiles of the dispersion also sums up the book. As the people of Christ gathered out of the world, collected into the church, exiled by the world, but chosen by God, sprinkled with the blood of Jesus Christ and obedient unto him, who are we and how should we live? That's 1 Peter. And so in this verse, I'm not going to launch into so what does it mean to be obedient unto God and what are his commands unto us? Because Peter's going to give us a great deal of instruction about how to live as faithful Christians in a world that has exiled us. But what do we see in these initial verses, this, this greeting from Peter to the saints? We see that God has set us apart. We see that God has separated us from our sin. And we see that God has set us apart for obedience unto him. We live according to his law. And we've also noted that all of these things, 
are covenant promises. All of this belongs to the new covenant that God has made with us. Well, I want to conclude with three points, three points of conclusion, observation, application. Number one, I want us to note the complete package of salvation. The complete package of salvation. The scriptures teach us that faith and works are inseparable. You can't have the blood of Jesus Christ without a faith that also loves and serves and obeys Jesus Christ. The same faith that reaches out to Jesus for forgiveness, that same true and living faith will serve Jesus Christ and love Jesus Christ and obey Jesus Christ. The point is, you can't pick and choose what you want from the covenant. If you are picking and choosing how to relate to God, then you have created your own covenant and you have consecrated yourself unto God on your own terms in your own made-up covenant. You have a new, new covenant, and you should never have a new, new covenant. You see, if you live for God, so to speak, on your own terms, then you're saying unto God, you're going to God and saying, you will be my God, and I will be your people. You will give me salvation, and I will give you hour and a half on Sunday, maybe in the afternoon too, if I'm really feeling it. That's all I'm going to give you. And I guess I'll live a, you know, a more or less moral life throughout the week, and I'll listen to a Christian radio station. If you decide how to covenant with God, you are not in covenant with God. You don't say to God, you will be my God, and I will be your people. You will give me salvation, and I will give you what I want to give you. No, rather God sovereignly comes to us and says, this is my covenant. I make it with you. And so we need to see that the blood of Jesus Christ that cleanses us from all our sins is inseparable from obedience to that same Jesus Christ. You are chosen and set apart for both obedience and sprinkling. So salvation is a complete package. You don't set yourself apart unto God. God sets you apart. You don't set the terms of the covenant. God sets the terms of the covenant. God does not negotiate. God sovereignly and graciously gives us the new covenant. And that new covenant grants salvation as a complete package. We receive Christ by faith, and that same living faith serves and obeys God. Because we do not simply believe in Christ as Savior, but also as Lord. And Romans 10, 9, which is often uh, rightly repeated as a passage that describes salvation, talks about believing in your heart that God has raised Jesus from the dead. He is Savior, but also confessing with your mouth that he is Lord. And so there's no coming to Christ that does not also involve obeying him and all that he has commanded. So I ask you to take very seriously this question. Do you live a, a Christian life on your own terms? Do you do church your way? If so, your covenant with God is a fake covenant. And your Christianity is false. And to be honest, your salvation is suspect. Jesus said, if you love me, you will keep my commands. I am the one who commands. You are the one who obeys. And if you love me, that's not a burden. If you love me, that's not a, a, a deal breaker. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. And Peter says, that's why we've been set apart, to be sprinkled with Christ's blood and to obey him, to live for him. Salvation is a complete package. Sadly, in, in our modern Christian culture, there are many churches who don't even have a defined membership. And that's a weakness. That's, a, that's an area in which those churches are deficient. And so many people are raised in a church and have grown up in a church where the idea of membership is at least foreign, if not almost repulsive to them. 
And we need to understand that we must live according to Christ's laws. We must live according to Christ's commandments. And Christ did not establish a church of rogue Christians. Christ established a church where there is a number and there are pastors who oversee that number. And there are those who are baptized by the church into the church and join the church and fellowship with the church and join with the church in communion at the Lord's table with the church. You see, the church is an institution and an organism. And so I'm, I'm bringing this point up because we often see at our church people who, who come and attend and even for years will come and attend but will not become members of the church. And who many times decide, well, I don't want to come to an afternoon service. They want to live their way. Is it because an afternoon service is absolutely necessary to live the Christian life? No, it's not. That's not the point I'm making. But there are people who just, they don't want to live in any other way than the way that they want to live. I'm willing to come on my terms. I'm willing to do what I want to do, and that's as far as I will go. Whereas Peter says, God has set you apart to be completely faithful and obedient unto him. And what he commands, we render obedience unto those commands. And so I want to challenge those who have not become members of the church. I want to encourage you. I want to say, be faithful unto your Lord and Savior. Join his church. Make yourself accountable to his church. It is a wonderful wonderful blessing. Do not live by your own covenant, because if you do, it is no covenant at all. Think about this. Let's, here's the time machine. Go into the time machine. Set the year for 4,000 years ago. Let's go back to ancient Israel. Maybe not quite 4,000 years ago. Let's go 3,000 years ago. Ancient Israel. Could you live in your own way could you live the Israelite covenant your own way? Could you say, you know, I'm going to live in Israel. I'm going to live in Jerusalem. But I'm not, as a male, I'm not going to be circumcised. And I'm going to eat whatever I want because bacon is great. And Baal worship, I'm going to do that. I'm going to have an astra pole in, in, my, uh, in my house. I'm going to make high places. I'm going to offer sacrifices the way I want. Could you live in Israel and just live the covenant the way you would want to? Well, in a sense, you can, but there's consequences, aren't there? When the Israelites did that, what happened to them? When they whored after other gods, when they polluted the, temp the worship of the temple, when they were disobedient unto God, what happened? He punished them. He did not allow them to live by their own laws in the covenant. He did not allow them to break the covenant. And so just as Israelites could not live their own covenant life in Israel, Christians cannot live their own covenant life in the church. The Apostle Peter says, you have been consecrated and set apart for the sprinkling of Christ's blood and obedience unto him. Salvation is a complete package. This is a wonderful gift. Secondly, take note, number two, of the Trinitarian nature of salvation. The Trinitarian nature of of salvation. If you do a word search in the Bible for the word Trinity, you won't find it, of course. So where does the doctrine of the Trinity come from in the scriptures? From many places. One of the ways in which the doctrine of the Trinity is recognized and formulated is to see places where Father, Son, and Holy Spirit appear together. And this in 1 Peter chapter, or chapter 1, verse 2, is such an instance. We have Father, Son, and Spirit all together. Now, I've entitled this point, Notice the Nature of Trinitarian Salvation, intentionally. And I also labeled the first three main points in an intentional way. I said, God set us apart. God separated us from sin. God consecrated us for obedience. I use the word God on purpose in those points. Why is that? Well, it would be possible to misread or misunderstand Peter in a way that would actually destroy the doctrine of the Trinity, even if unintentionally. For example, we might read 1 Peter 1 verse 2, where it says, The foreknowledge of God the Father 
the sanctification of the Spirit, the sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. And we might think, okay, so God has the foreknowledge, the Spirit has the sanctification, and then Jesus the Son has uh, sprinkling. And each one does his own thing, so to speak. Well, that's when the, the sirens go off and the 911 theology team runs in and says, no, that's heresy. So let me, let me explain briefly something that requires a great deal more explanation, but time is short and we are finite. I would like you to write down two truths, two propositions. Number one, the external works of the Trinity are undivided. The external works of the Trinity are undivided. And the second phrase or proposition is, the external works of the Trinity, same beginning, the external works of the Trinity are appropriated, are appropriated. Now let me briefly explain what these two statements mean. We must remember that God is not triple, but triune. God is not triple, but triune. God is not three, full stop. God is three in one. So we must not think of the persons of the Trinity as being so distinct that one does something and the others don't. Rather, when the power of God is exercised, it is the power of God, the power of the one true God. And so the one God does all things undividedly. The external works, what God does to create and all things in creation, all things outside of God, the external works... These are undivided. The power of God undividedly accomplishes all that we see in creation unto consummation. All of this is done by the power of God undividedly. Because if you have God doing this, then you'd have and another God doing this, then you have another God. You don't have this God with this God power, and this God with this God power, and this God with this God power, each doing their own thing. No, the external works of the Trinity, what God does, God does undividedly. The power of God is the power of God. If you have three powers, you have three gods. If you have three knowledges, you have three gods. So the foreknowledge of the Father is not distinct from the foreknowledge of the Spirit or the foreknowledge of the Son, according to the divine nature. But, that being said, the scriptures do attribute certain works to certain persons. Or we could say that certain persons appropriate certain works. And we find, just, just by studying the scriptures, we find that the scriptures consistently attribute certain works to certain persons. Or certain works are appropriated by certain persons of the Trinity in a way that matches who they are. So, because the Father is of none, and because the Son is of the Father eternally begotten, and because the Spirit... I shouldn't be doing this. Doing this. <laughs> because the Father is of none, and the Son is eternally begotten of the Father, and the Spirit eternally proceeds from them both, therefore works of origin and creation are usually attributed to or appropriated by the Father. And works of redemption or, or development are usually attributed to or appropriated by the Son. And works of completion or consummation or the application of redemption are ordinarily attributed to or appropriated by the Holy Spirit. And so we may attribute works to certain persons because the scriptures speak this way, but we must never do so in a way that divides the works of God into three gods. So as we read the knowledge of the Father, the sanctification of the Spirit, and the sprinkling of Jesus Christ, we have to be careful here 
not to think that, well, the Father knows all things, but the Spirit and the Son do not. Or the Father has the power, but the Spirit and the Son do not know. All three being co-equal in majesty, glory, power, and eternity forever and ever. Amen. Now, if you'd like to read more about that, I can recommend resources to you uh, privately. But we must not miss here in 1 Peter 1, 2, first of all, an appearance of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, but an appearance that we must understand carefully, lest we think of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit in too separated a manner. Salvation is Trinitarian. And so it is therefore appropriate to say things like, God has saved us. And by that we mean the Father has saved us, the Son has saved us, and the Holy Spirit has saved us. Now where theology gets abundantly and exceedingly difficult is in the incarnation. Because the human nature of Jesus is the one that suffers. And the human nature of Jesus is that which dies, etc. Not the divine nature, but that's another subject. All three together act undividedly in the external works. Thirdly and lastly, our third and final conclusion, note the exclusive source of salvation. Note the exclusive source of salvation. You know the song, What Can Wash Away My Sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me pure within? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Peter here tells us that these Christians were sprinkled, cleansed, purified, forgiven with the blood of Jesus. And so we must note that there is no other cleansing There is no other forgiveness. There is no other remission of sins, taking away of sins, except by the blood of Jesus Christ. And so I want to ask you this morning, have you been washed in that fountain filled with Emmanuel's blood of which we sung previously this morning? In Revelation 22, we also read of a cleansing river coming from the throne of God that removes the curse brings complete healing to the nations, and we're told to come to that water and drink without price. Where do we find that healing? Where do we find that curse-reversing cleansing? It's the blood of Jesus Christ, which is the exclusive source of salvation. And that blood is offered to us in the new covenant. Have you been set apart by the new covenant? Are you holy unto God? Have you been washed with the blood of Jesus Christ? And are you living in obedience unto him? This is where salvation is found and nowhere else. The blood of Jesus Christ. But what must I do to to receive this blood? What must I do in order to earn this blood? Revelation 22 already told you, without price. Without price. As we sing, without money, without money, come and buy. As we've said so many times before, saving faith is the outstretched hand of of a hopeless sinner, hopeless in himself, who just says, please have mercy. Please have mercy on me. And God gives it. God grants it. God cleanses with the blood of Jesus Christ all those who come to him to be saved from their sins. And so let us be encouraged, we who have been set apart, We are who we are because God chose us for this and set us apart for this and cleansed us for this and makes us obedient for this. Praised be God the Father. Praised be God the Son. Praised be God the Holy Spirit. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, how we thank you for our consecration for our sprinkling and for the way in which you sanctify us and make us obedient we pray that you would help us to grow in maturity and holiness in joy and hope in all the fruit of the spirit because you have given us your spirit and we call out and cry out by the spirit unto you our dear father 
And we thank you and we praise you for all that you have done for us. Please encourage us and build us up yet more, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.